everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Bethany Hill McCarthy from IBM Research Communications. We're looking forward to a lively discussion today about the latest research in AI automation. First, a little bit of background info. Today, we see that IT is going through a fundamental shift that increasingly requires CIOs to act as a partner in enabling business transformation through AI. As a result, we know that IT will need to become more scalable and adaptable, and that's causing enterprises to move towards a hybrid cloud IT architecture. And we know that AI is gonna play a fundamental role in this, especially when applied to code, the language of machines. So we're excited to talk about this and share more with you today. But before we get started, I wanna take a minute to run through a couple of quick items and reminders for today's discussion. First, thank you for joining us. I wanna acknowledge that this virtual format was established in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we hope each of you is safe and healthy wherever you are. Second, there are a few links I wanna highlight in the top left corner of your screen. One is a blog post about AI innovations for hybrid cloud. Another is a blog post about AI for IT operations. And the final is a demo video of Mono to Micro, a tool that we'll talk a little bit more about today. Throughout the event, you will have the opportunity to ask questions either for all the panelists or to a specific person. Just indicate who the question is for. You should see a little Q&A window on your screen and that's where you can submit your questions. We'll save the last 10 minutes of today for questions and try to get through as many as we can. For any additional questions or follow-ups that we don't get to, just let the IBM representative you've been working with know and we'll work to connect you with the appropriate panelist. We also, in the next day or two, will have a replay of this event. And following this discussion, we'll share that link with each of you and other relevant resources. With that, I want to now turn it over to today's moderator, Pat Moorhead, founder, president, and general uh, owner of More Insights and Strategy. Pat, the floor is yours. And I think what Pat's trying to say is he's on mute is he wants to thank all of you for coming. We have a great panel today of three different panelists. Can you hear me now, Pat? Thank you. Yeah, I had the double mute going. My apologies, but uh, super excited. And uh, I see a lot of my uh, my friends out there. And it's just wonderful. And uh, I'm the only person who's not uh, a PhD uh, on on this panel. So uh, I am I'm blessed to to be sitting with such a, a smart crowd. So um, Great topic. Uh, we do a lot of research on AI and more insights and strategy. And this is essentially, um, uh, what if AI can converse with machines? Uh, a lot of consumers are already using a lot of uh, chat-based services uh, uh, out there. And we've seen uh, a lot of machine learning uh, be put into commercial use uh, as well. So we're going to be talking about uh, that topic and also how it intersects with the private cloud. But what I'd like uh, to do is have the panelists introduce themselves. Let's start, our, start off with uh, Dr. Nick Fuller. Thank you, Pat. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Nick Fuller. I lead, have the privilege to lead a global team at IBM Research in this role as Director of Hybrid Cloud Services. We're responsible for delivering innovation to differentiate our hybrid cloud platform. Excellent. Let me, let's uh, go off to uh, uh, Dr. Munindar Singh. Hi, everyone. I uh, hope you can hear me. Yes, I'm Munindar Singh. I'm a professor of computer science at NC State University. Uh, I've been working on AI for uh, a long time, since my dissertation. Uh, my interest has been uh, in applications of AI uh, in businesses, and especially I looked at uh, challenges that arise from services, processes, contracts, um, stepping back a little uh, more on notions of accountability. <clears throat> and in the last uh, few years, I've also looked at ethics more and more closely. Excellent. Let's move on to uh, Dr. Bashaki Ray. Hello, everyone. Um, 
thanks for coming to this panel. Uh, I am Baishaki Ray. I am an assistant professor at Columbia University. Um, so my main uh, topic of research is how we can mod I mean how we can apply machine learning to model the code behavior so that we can automate a lot of software engineering or program analysis related tasks and um, can help developers in uh, many ways. Great stuff. So why don't we uh, why don't we dive right in here? And probably the best place to start would be for uh, a level set. And maybe we can talk about where we are right now in research uh, on this topic. And and maybe uh, we can get all the panelists to talk through this one. But maybe we start off with uh, by Shaki. All right. Yeah. Uh, so. I can talk, I mean, this is a very large and diverse topic. So let me kind of go in detail what I do uh, in my research group. So, you know, with the advent of, uh, say, GitHub, Bitbucket, et cetera, basically open source software, um, there are huge amount of software data is available. So right now um, you can treat code as data, like code as your data. And of course, these uh, code data, I mean, we call it big code as opposed to big data. And this big code has their own properties, like uh, they have more structure than, say, natural language like English. They have uh, different semantic properties, etc. So we are building specialized model, deep learning models, to learn uh, these properties from code and um, leverage that to automate many different tasks. Say one, uh, I mean, the particular task I am working on and I actively collaborate with IBM is uh, automatically detecting vulnerabilities. Um, so here the idea is that you can learn from the code and as well as previous vulnerabilities and then um, use that knowledge to detect future vulnerabilities automatically. And I mean, again, this topic is very diverse. You can do many other um, tasks, like say you can even automate code writing to some extent. Um, you can um, synthesize small programs, not like, of course, not a bigger, like I cannot, at, with current technology, I cannot synthesize a whole big code, but I can sub synthesize like very small functions, things like that. So, yeah, I mean, this, this whole area is very exciting. And then, I mean, there is a lot of research opportunity uh, in this direction. Yeah, what a great way to start out. Uh, thank you for such a comprehensive answer uh, here. Uh, maybe we uh, give the same question to Munindar. Thanks. Um, yes, I, I would say that uh, you know research is at a stage where I think it's, it's, uh, we made enough progress that we should be interested. Like it's on the you know the cusp of greatness. Uh, I would say uh, that we are able to. Uh, understand code, uh, you know, more and more than, than we ever were, uh, more and more effectively. Uh, there are ways, um, and some of them I'm, I'm working with uh, colleagues at IBM uh, Research uh, on. Uh, they are about uh, abstracting services from uh, existing, you know, uh, legacy kinds of proce processes and, and software. So there are techniques that come into play, and these techniques apply. I think the interesting thing there is that they apply uh, not only AI techniques, but they uh, combine those AI techniques with uh, an understanding of uh, traditional sort of computing semantics that that you need to uh, understand uh, that you use as the basis for software. Nick, do you have anything uh, to add uh, to this? I hope you do. <laughs> Absolutely, Pat. Thank you. Uh, so, pulling together the the pieces that you got already from professors Ray and Singh, uh, the the novelty here is the following. AI applied to machine language is the area where essentially accelerating, uh, which underpins information technology. And 
it's not as if uh, there hasn't been AI applied to information technology before. In fact, in Pat's intro, he touched on bots, for example. Bots today provide technical support for a range of products. IBM and others have majored in this space for some time. But when you look at what is critical to enterprises, traditional enterprises going forward, it's the ability to unlock the value of cloud for their mission critical workloads. That's a challenge. The fundamental work we're doing in collaboration with Professors Ray Singh and many others in academia out there helps us to advance the knowledge in that space to ultimately get mission critical workloads to hybrid cloud. And that's the cusp and synergy of hybrid cloud and AI. And it's an area of pursuit for us that drives tremendous excitement all the way up to our CEO. Yeah, it is incredible that uh, what, uh, you know, this area, AI in general is about 50 years old. And, you know, we've had a lot of cycles uh, in uh, and out, uh, but there are real companies uh, doing real workloads, uh, solving real problems uh, out there. And, um, you know, getting computers to talk to each other, uh, to some might sound uh, easy, but, uh, it can't, there's no way it can be that easy. And, and I'm curious, what are some of the challenges uh, that you're facing uh, right now when you're teaching software uh, to communicate uh, with other software? And, and maybe we can start with uh, Munindar. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah I mean, at, at one level, you know, getting software to talk to other software would, as you say, you know, seem to be the, the simplest possible thing. Uh, but the challenges, they apply at various levels, and oddly enough, uh, these are challenges that people have known for for decades. You know, from the very early days of computing. So there was, you know, people that came up with the abstraction of a subroutine. You know, they had to figure out how the subroutine could be called, and there was a lot of debate about you know how you could do it in a in a way that would be reusable, so that you could write your sub one person could write a subroutine that another person could use and make sense of. Uh, at the same time, or a little later, there was this effort with uh, you know, process integration in manufacturing, I think General Motors and those kinds of companies, they wanted to share data with their partners and they came up with uh, approaches to be able to understand the data, like one party produces a data that another can understand. Uh, in the very early days, they were more concerned with like agreeing on even the encoding standards, like not everybody used ASCII or, you know, there was no UTF and, uh, and so forth. Uh, later they realized that that was just not good enough. Just agreeing on the encoding wasn't enough. You needed to have some more structure to the data to, to be able to understand it better. And still later, uh, so but I think the data part of it is, I would say, well understood now. Still later there was an idea that we should under reconcile the processes. And that part is uh, less well understood. And if you ab abstract further, there's an idea that there's an understanding of contracts. Like, you know, one piece of software written by one person would interpret uh, a request from another piece of software written by a second person uh, in a way that makes sense. And so it, in other words, it comes down to the challenges of you know, dealing with heterogeneity, that these are, they are written by different people and you know, there must be a common language to make it happen. But it turns out the common language is not trivial. It's not just agreeing on the, the letters you're using or, or the words you're using, but you have to think of the, not, you know, not just the sentences, but think of how the sentences will be interpreted. Uh, so we have, I think, uh, several pieces of what we need to uh, apply uh, in the present setting are well understood, but several others uh, are becoming understood. And if you think of a concrete question, so instead of just you know software talking to software, let's say you want to uh, convert your legacy applications into uh, into services, you'd want services being reused. Otherwise, you know, why have services? And that means you had to contend with all these challenges about how one service is going to interpret the uh, information passed to it by another service. So uh, I, I could go on, but I think I should pause here and see if there are more questions later. So this is very much uh, not easy. Um, and it seems like anything that has to do with AI or machine learning isn't, isn't easy. Hence, we have uh, three PhDs here right now. So um, not to make something that's already complex more complex, but I do think there is a role in the cloud. And, and I think the notion of the public cloud was uh, very popular for around a decade. Uh, and, and I like to say that we used to be in this drunken sailor mode in the industry that says, oh, it has to be in the private cloud. 
uh, even though most of the data was not, uh, in, sorry, in the public cloud, but most of the data was 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 on prem. Uh, and, and then just uh, recently, uh, the industry, everybody has pretty much agreed uh, that the future of IT is the hybrid cloud uh, and multi-cloud, where uh, you have uh, different cloud operations on-prem, uh, you have uh, a little bit of it in public, uh, you have some uh, even on the edge. So uh, let me pose this question for Nick. Nick, what is the role uh, of the hybrid cloud in in this evolution. Yeah, thank you, Pat. So you, you point and touch on a very important issue, namely the issue of public cloud having a place uh, going back 10 years ago, but the acceptance of hybrid cloud being key going forward. And yeah. the reason for that is 70% or so of traditional enterprises are looking at more than one public cloud vendor to move their workloads for a variety of reasons, for openness, uh, for the ability to integrate with their on-premise applications and so on. Additionally, when you look at the various industry verticals, there are key advantages for regulated industries, for example, be it financial, be it telecom and so on, as far as moving their workloads to uh, multiple public clouds to unlock that value, the agility value the availability value, the resiliency value, and the ability to connect with other services. And last but not least, remember, you know, 20%, only 20% have moved to the public cloud already of those yeah. mission critical workloads. Now that's the business point of view. When you combine that with the technology pieces that are essential, uh, Professor Singh touched on this before, modernizing workloads, whether that be replatforming them, refactoring them, Key challenges underpinned by the AI for code examples given at the start of the webcast. That journey to take workloads to cloud from on-premise through the various phases from advise, move, build to manage requires sophisticated tooling, tooling with intelligence, what we collectively call AI-infused automation. So that's key. And then the hybrid cloud platform, which naturally comes out of this, and OpenShift, of course, that's why we made that huge investment in Red Hat, has to bring intrinsic capabilities to bring those two together, the tooling and the platform through APIs, workflows, and the like. And when you combine all of that, the technology pieces and the business pieces, that's the $1.2 trillion opportunity in front of us. Yeah, I like the way you, uh, you laid that out. Uh, and the good news is it's exactly as I see the world <laughs> as well. Uh, we were one of the first analyst firms to talk about the hybrid cloud about a decade ago, and, and people thought we were crazy. But, but here we are. Uh, it's a reality, and it's what everybody is, is doing right now. So uh, let's get back to uh, AI. Um, and by Shaki, this question is, is for you. Uh, what is the role of AI in this evolution with a specific focus uh, on machine language? Um, you know, this machine language is very diverse. Like the, the kind of applications uh, Nick and Maninder was were talking about, you can think about those applications at a very high level, like where you are talking about different systems, different services at a very high level macro granularity. And again, um, many other researchers like me, um, we kind of look at the low level where we go towards the source code or even execution trace, stack trace, et cetera. And I believe that the opportunity is huge because it has this whole code spectra, like from uh, like configuration space, this uh, refactoring legacy services to the, to modernize them to like, to the lowest end to machine language. And I think at which granularity you look at this machine language, they have very different properties and you have to basically come up with different kind of AI modeling or AI technique. Those are like your very much application specific and at what granularity you are applying. And there uh, is a huge potential for innovation. Hey, 
Pat, we're not hearing you at the moment. It's that double mute. My apologies. No problem. Um, let's uh, move to the next question. It's like tying your shoelaces uh, twice. Uh, I, I won't do that again, I promise. Um, so, uh, Munindar, this question is for you. Uh, we have legacy software uh, that's useful, obviously. Um, you know, there are some financial institutions that, that have 50,000 apps that have been built uh, over uh, the last 50 years. Uh, it's just incredible. But that doesn't necessarily make them, them current. Uh, how can AI help modernize uh, software uh, to what I, I'll call the cloud age? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. And I think your uh, your analogy with the shoelaces is, is right on because you really do need to maybe untie the shoelaces twice to make it work. So there is the, uh, I think the, the kind of work that uh, Bashati and her community work uh, pursue, which is that they're looking at, you know, source code line by line. And I think that's essential. Um, and then there's the other end of it that you know if you're trying to modernize uh, legacy applications, you have to understand the business processes where they fit in. Also, otherwise, you know how could you how could you make sense of what's going down in the in, in the in the in the code if you didn't know where you were headed? And I think AI can apply in both uh, both of those aspects. There is, uh, you know, as I said earlier in response to your previous question about the um, about getting software to communicate with other software. It comes down to meaning, right? At some level, it's the it's the level of uh, it's the is the interpretation of this communication that we need. But that interpretation partly relies on, like the words you are using, you know, which is kind of the you could say the machine language aspect of it, and partly relies on the context of where where they fit in, like what's the, what's our previous discussion or you know, where it where it would um, um, like if I use a pronoun, you know, how do you know what I'm talking about if you didn't know what I talked about earlier? So, so I, I would use that analogy and say that you know, we need AI at both of these levels. So we need AI to understand the business processes at a uh, at a, a general level in a way that you know produces representations that can uh, advise the low level analysis. And then similarly, uh, from the uh, the code analysis, we need to have abstractions that has some bearing on uh, on the processes that we are trying to conduct. And if you can do those together in a nice way. Uh, then we have a hope of uh, converting these monolithic applications into sort of you know elegant systems of microservices. Uh, if you try to do only one of them, then you know uh, we do have the shoelace in the wrong place, uh, like you said. Uh, is I'm pretty sure that this is beyond theory at this point. Are there any real examples of utilities that are that are out there that are currently doing this? Uh, are you, yeah. So. Uh, I, I think that there are pieces of them. So I, I know, um, I know with you know on the business process side, there's lots of discussion in the finance industry, for example, in healthcare, uh, things are messed up. I think on the, uh, but as, I, I, as far as I know, they haven't done too much of the code analysis there. Then the my colleagues at IBM, um, they are looking at the code analysis for a long time and uh, more and more recently. So I, I think in a way, uh, you could say that both of these aspects have been addressed. But maybe they have not yet been addressed in a unified manner, and maybe the current efforts uh, would, would take care of that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I've seen uh, some uh, people in the financial uh, industry do an analysis of their code, and it actually finds dead links that, that aren't, yeah. aren't ever used. And, and you know, it's not as easy as just cutting that bad code uh, out, but it certainly tells you what you have to transform and what you don't have to transform. Uh, and I find that uh, 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 really cool. Uh, so, Nick, I'm I mean, yeah. sorry, just to finish the thought, I mean, uh, so indeed, yes, and, and the, that dead code and the, those you know, bad legacy code is reflected in horrible processes. Like it might take them you know, a month to handle a loan transaction, which literally should not take any, you know, more than an hour, you, know, you would think. And so there are other questions of that. That's cool. So uh, I'm going to turn it back to uh, uh, Nick. This question is for you. So uh, we talked about the synergy between the hybrid cloud uh, and AI. And uh, what are some of notable successes uh, that you've um, that you've seen emerge uh, out there? Yeah, thanks, Pat. So one of the things we did going back to think. Uh, symposium earlier this year 
was to launch this AI for IT initiative, uh, specifically focused on building innovation, AI-infused automation tooling, uh, spanning the full lifecycle application lifecycle management of workload journey to cloud. And uh, again, with major focus, of course, on mission critical workloads. And so when you look at the fundamental pieces uh, ultimately underpinned by AI for Code, part of that allowed us to make announcements with respect to automation tooling for modernization, right? So if you look at uh, one of the links Bethany referenced at the beginning of the webcast, uh, here we have a beta product uh, known as Monitor Micro, which looks at code analysis, uh, takes in additional inputs, and is able to refactor applications, identifying dead code as well. Uh, additionally, with our services units, uh, we launched uh, application modernization accelerator with AI, a toolkit uh, made up of a suite of different tools that ultimately take you through that modernization journey from the advice phase, uh, identifying what makes sense to containerize and what doesn't. And once you've identified uh, what makes sense to containerize, how you actually go about that journey, what's the GPS to get you there, given that each client and each application will have a unique uh, journey, so to speak. And then finally, what are the microservices that you recommend and how you can now construct that in an automatic fashion? Uh, that toolkit actually uh, earlier this quarter, going back to 3Q, various pieces were released for general availability. The other big announcement we made back then was around application availability. Getting to cloud is one thing. Wherever applications reside, they need to be available. Outages cost time, they certainly cost money. Uh, their estimates, uh, major outages can go all the way up to half a million or more. And so we launched what is known as Watson AI Ops, uh, product for addressing incident management uh, and outages uh, related to changes uh, made to applications. And that capability as well, that tool as well, was also GA'd earlier this quarter. So these are some notable uh, advances, if you will, that we've made in this space, overall AI for IT, and we continue to ramp up as we look forward to the future. Well, I tell you, Nick, I, I remember seeing that at Think, and it just, it literally blew my mind, uh, some demos uh, of, of that tool. Uh, particularly the dead code and the and the what should be containerized and 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 what shouldn't it, it was pretty awesome uh so just a reminder to our attendees uh you can add uh ask your questions now in the chat bot chat box we don't have a chat bot maybe we should uh, uh so at the very end of the show uh we can take them so uh let's move to security right now you know it's funny uh, I, I kind of think is that as spy versus spy, uh, and, and we have now nation state budgets to go in and and hack people. Uh, you, you know, hacking reached prime time when there's actually hacking as a service uh, out there. You can literally go into the dark web and and put an order in, uh, just like you might, you know, fire up uh, a public cloud. It's pretty crazy. So, uh, what I'd like to do is ask uh, by Shaki, uh, how big of a concern is security when you have software auto magically talking to and working with uh, uh, other software? Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe some of your work on security vulnerabilities and and risk analysis and vulnerability analysis? Right. So. Uh, uh I mean, security is always a concern um, whether you apply AI or not. Um, I think the role of, I mean, the role of AI is kind of two folds here, at least the way I see it. First, um, when we think about traditional applications like uh, legacy applications, etc. cetera, uh, you know, there is usually a repetitive patterns uh, in the way hackers hack your software. And uh, it is, and that pattern is not always obvious, it's uh, noisy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But with this uh, advent of big code, uh, now we can learn those patterns, like what are the potential, uh, context uh, in the code or in your environment that make it prone to security attacker. And um, 
we are now building model to automatically identify those uh, security critical region, you know, like which are prone to attacker. And um, so far, the results look very promising. So I think AI will play and AI already started playing and it will also play a, a, a very important role in identifying those uh, those cases, I mean, which are prone to attack. Saying that, uh, Another problem we are, um, I think, uh, AI can solve. Like currently, this AI-based software is coming up uh, in cloud and also. So there it comes with another kind of security threat. So there uh, you can say AI is communicating with other models, not only traditional software. And um, I mean, I think this new, new, uh, kind of so AI based software will be also another point of uh, discussion when we talk about security. Yeah, Nick, IBM mm -hmm. is very uh, entrenched in, in the security areas. In fact, I, I think by a lot of estimates, IBM is the number, the, the largest security company uh, on, on the planet. I'm, I'm sure you have some comments on this. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, when you look at our 20, 2019 uh, annual report, we, we talked about, we mentioned in that report, looking at over 70 billion events uh, a day, right, in that report. Uh, it's interesting because the security and compliance concerns for traditional enterprises don't go away. In fact, they go up as they move to cloud. And so we're approaching this from a holistic point of view. Right? There's the fundamental, absolutely critical work that we're doing both in research uh, with Bashaki's team and uh, Bashaki is also conducting as well, and I'm sure many others uh, from a build point of view. Right, So clearly uh, what happens at build time is absolutely critical. If you can minimize what's deployed, that's fantastic. But once actually deployed, right, uh, there are concerns there as well. In fact, we, we did a cost of a data breach study uh, not too long ago, and that study revealed uh, from 11 uh, vulnerability uh, detections it cost organizations upward of 57 billion, a huge total when you think about it, uh, given that it's only 11, <laughs> right? We haven't gotten into the hundreds or thousands, so to speak. And so there's critical work we're doing uh, at runtime as well uh, in IBM Research, coupled with our security business unit, looking at uh, going beyond what uh, NIST, National Institute of Standards, uh, common vulnerability scoring system does, and namely, the degree to which a vulnerability can be weaponized by a malicious attacker. You talk about going to uh, uh, hacker sites uh, on the dark web and, and prescribing what you want. The idea here with these services in X-Force Red is to programmatically enable us to determine not only the weaponization of those vulnerabilities, but the skill level a hacker would need to have in order to weaponize a given vulnerability. And when you put these together, capabilities that we recently released for general availability as well, it allows us to get to a level of scale because these things were being handled manually before, and clearly that doesn't get you to scale. So with the programmatic enablement in the X-Force Red suite of capabilities, you can imagine how we can finally allow organizations to prioritize what they look for, what they addressed first from a vulnerability standpoint to minimize security disruptions. Gosh, I love, uh, I love that. You know, I talked about uh, spy versus spy and, you know, one of the biggest challenges that, that IT has today uh, is, is fielding the amount of red alerts. And when, when you have hackers using machine learning, uh, really the only thing you can do is have machine learning on the other side to, um, to, to react to that, it's uh, it's fascinating. So um, let's uh, move into our next question here, um, and uh, maybe uh, by shock, I can hit, hit hit you up with this if this is okay. Uh, what are the biggest misperceptions uh, you see around the capabilities of these types of of automations? How should the average person think about this and the role of AI of automation in code? So, um, 
Well, I mean, uh, again, I think, one, I mean, one thing I have noticed uh, when we are building these models, uh, most of these models are very application specific. So, you know, if I say build a model uh, with uh, Linux operating systems, it might not uh, well, I mean, work very well with say Mac operating systems. So basically, I think that we this generalizability of the models are still lacking. Uh, it are uh, these are quite uh, environment specific and uh, very much tied to your applications. Um, so that is, I think, one uh, major. Uh, I mean, if the we want to you know, adopt AI in a much larger context for the whole tool chain, maybe, um, and I mean, people already started talking about it, but maybe a more generic way to represent this whole tool chain in a machine learning context would be necessary. Excellent, thank you. And sorry to put you on the spot there, um, but uh, maybe we can go uh, Meninder. Uh, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, a, a couple of thoughts. So I, I also wanted to comment on the security uh, thing, if, if I may briefly, since we talked about it. Uh, I, I think modernization provides, you know, for security, it provides us both an opportunity and a, and a challenge. The opportunity is, I think, with, with monolithic systems, is typically, you know, once they are breached, they are breached. I think with, uh, with modernized service-based systems, you have the hope that there could be an attacker and you could still, uh, you know, function while there's an attacker. So you could uh, achieve something that's resilient. And it, it relates also to the misperception because, you know, what it, what happens to applying AI is sometimes that you the AI tools themselves are more complex. So so your your end product may not be complex, but the tools are. And sometimes people don't realize, um, first of all, that there could be a problem in the tools themselves, like there could be security problems induced by the tools. And secondly, uh, sometimes they don't realize. I, I think that echoes Bajaki's comment that this is. Uh, very much an application specific or a, or a domain specific exercise that although the tool will help you it's not going to be uh, like push a button and you get a you know you get an answer out of it and i noticed that sometimes with with, uh, with people i've interacted with who are not um, i guess they're not computer scientists or although they've used computing a lot they sometimes have this view uh, i think a big misperception that uh, ai is a bit like magic to them like the things that really you know here's a problem and you know just the AI will solve it, or you know, and I think it, it never quite turns out like that because you have to think about the representations you want to build uh, for the AI to run, and there are, I mean, advances in you know uh, which reduce the effort in, that you have in, in the representations, but this, but that misperception still remains, and uh, the work is never um, uh, quite as automated as you would uh, hope it uh, should be, hope it could be, I guess. So maybe we can wrap up, uh, uh, Nick. I'm sure you've got a lot to say uh, on on this topic. Uh, I saw automation, and you know, bells uh, bells went off. I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely, Pat. So I, I want to echo what Linda said a second ago. Right, uh, AI isn't a hammer in search of a nail. Right, it's more a question of where we see opportunity, uh, like in security mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, like in modernization and specific aspects of modernization as well. Now, when we, and I use the phrase as well, AI-infused automation tooling, uh, one potential uh, conclusion that one might derive, technical or not, is that, okay, so there's a, a replacement, essentially, of the practitioner that's happening with such tooling. And that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, in fact, if you go back to the days of Jeopardy, when we first introduced the notion of uh, AI with Jeopardy, we talked about AI augmenting uh, what a practitioner has to do. And, and it's very much applicable in the hybrid cloud context. Uh, and I'll use just modernization as an example, we've, which we've talked about as well. When we go through that refactorization process, it's very much the case, given the uniqueness of every application, given the uniqueness of every industry vertical, that there may be the need for some customization, for the architect to add such customization based on use cases and so on. No different as well from the refactoring of the application from a gap analysis point of view. We need the practitioner, we need the architect to validate that and ultimately the functionality of the application. So just really wanna reinforce the point, 
that it's an augmentation approach. Uh, certainly, the tools are absolutely critical. Uh, they're complex, as mentioned before. But they get us to scale. They eliminate the need for the practitioner to conduct mundane manual tasks, which ultimately takes a long time and impedes scalability. So they get us to scale and upskills in many ways the practitioner by working in conjunction with the tooling. That's awesome. So um, what I'd like to do is close out the formal portion of this and move into, into q and A. I can't believe uh, we've been chatting for uh, for 40 minutes here, but uh, this is this is wonderful. So uh, we do have questions uh, piling uh, piling up here, and if if you are in the press, uh, please uh, add add your questions uh, in here. So um, let me see. The first question we have is. Um, and this one's for Nick. Uh, Nick, do you see specific industries being more aggressive than others to mature and adopt AI for IT? Uh, other observations on global geography, if there are regions pushing for faster adoption? Thank you, Pat. Uh, excellent question. Uh, the regulated industries actually are pushing quite aggressively, interestingly, from a financial services point of view as well. And I think if you look back at the history of this uh, from a sensitivity point of view, from a security compliance point of view, uh, the maturity of cloud has grown. They recognize that. They're staffed with you know, talented professionals as well who've kept pace with what has happened in the industry as cloud has grown and matured. But they also understand that with cloud, they can unlock the true agility and the ability to augment their applications once refactored and restructured with the various services that cloud providers, major vendors, the, all of the hyperscalers, IBM and others provide. So we're actually seeing quite an aggressive push uh, from uh, financial for sure. Other industries as well, but I will highlight financial in particular. No, that's good. And. Uh... If I were going to answer that question, it would have been uh, would have been the same thing. You know, the financial industries uh, really seem to be the trailblazers uh, in machine learning, par partially because they have uh, a need for it, a big need for it. Uh, but they also have research groups, uh, very large research groups that are that are experimenting and and doing uh, a lot of things. So um, uh, we have another question here uh, that's related to the rise of edge devices. And the question is, is do these innovations in AI contribute uh, to the rise of, of edge devices? And, and if, uh, how? And um, maybe uh, by Shaki, we can, uh, we can start with you, put you on the spot here. <laughs> so again, I, I I think these edge devices and IOTs, I mean, they, these are like huge scope for AI automation. One of the uh, main reason, I mean, is that these devices themselves generate lot and lot of data and constantly uh, populate data, right? So uh, how to uh, extract information from their output and then, um, is like very much in the scope of data analytics and then this whole tool chaining and how to uh, basically uh, smartly process those data, right? And then uh, do applications on top of it. So yeah, I mean, um, another uh, very much software engineering applications uh, regarding these devices is that uh, they are kind of depend a lot, their development depends a lot of frameworks and again you have to custom so there is this common framework part and for individual um, application or individual hardware you need customization so this blend between framework based development and customization the how ai can uh, take a uh, important part there is a very interesting uh, thing to think about so Pat, can I add to that? Uh, yeah, so I, I think uh, edge devices and especially IoT and these things, I think they bring out an aspect of AI which is under play today, which is that you're dealing with autonomous parties. And you know, yes. a lot of our way of thinking today is good for you know where there's one locus of control, but when you have thousands of uh, 
uh, entities you know computing at the same time and autonomously uh, it throws up you know huge new challenges and um, and they are certainly worth pursuing yeah it's interesting uh, if you look at uh, the amount of devices or just hardware that has let's say neural networks running on it uh, smartphones have more n concurrent neural networks uh, running on it than any other edge device that that's out there out there and and I'd even posit that um, uh, AI in the hybrid cloud is is truly enabling all of these uh, all of these edge devices so it's kind of a kind of chicken or the egg uh, type of of scenario and they and and they they play uh, off of off of each other and we have this constant push and pull now between uh, where are those AIs done right are they done close mm -hmm. to the edge are they, they done up in the cloud or some uh, some intermediary uh, step? Uh, what's happening in practice now is is is, the, is they they all are. So uh, let me move on to another question that I got in, and because um, quite frankly, everybody wants to hear from the PhDs, not from the uh, analyst pundit here. Uh, so AI research is constantly evolving. Looking back, how have you seen the focus of your research? change over time? And um, Meninder, why don't I start uh, with you? Yes, yeah, so there, there have been changes. Of, of course, you know, when, when I was a PhD student, we were, um, neural, well, neural networks have been around since the 50s, so long before my time, but they had uh, come in and fallen out of favor, you know, several times already by the time I was a student. And at the time I was a student, they were uh, not too much in favor, partly because I think well, obviously the computing power didn't exist. We didn't have the data to use them. And also the mathematics wasn't quite well understood. So people didn't know, really know what, how to deal with them. So the biggest change since in the last decade or so has been the revival of neural nets. Uh, and what I see now is, you know, so, so starting from this more knowledge-based approaches to the neural net style approaches. And what I see coming down the pike now is that people want to reconcile the two, that either you have these large, you have these current neural networks which will take, you know, millions of inputs to learn something and you compare them to a human baby you know, who just sees here's you know three words and they're able to you know construct new sentences that have never been seen that they've never heard before uh, so you know so there's a there's a there's a challenge about how to reconcile them how to understand the structure of meaning properly so mm -hmm. so there are so those are the kinds of emerging uh, tasks that are coming up uh, but yes uh, lots of changes Nick, what are you seeing uh, from your side? Yeah, in interestingly, I gave a talk to uh, internal talk to Worldwide Architects uh, in IBM, and one of the things I touched on was, you know, if you go back to say ten years ago, there's work that we were doing on uh, identifying uh, issues associated uh, with applications running on premise. And also uh, the approach that we took there was heavily around uh, what in, in AI we refer to as narrow AI. And if you think of the AI taxonomy as narrow, broad, and then ultimately general, narrow AI is essentially underpinned, of course, by deep learning, but with large amounts of labeled data, so a supervised approach. As you get into broader AI, concepts like learning from less data, uh, concepts like trust, a huge issue, concepts like uh, being able to provide explainability begin to emerge. And a lot of what we've done has dovetailed in that direction. Uh, the security work highlighted before falls into that category. Similarly, some of the modernization work that we're doing as well, likewise around IT operations. And so that to me is the biggest change. Practitioners want to really understand why they're being told to do X, Y, Z, right? If my job is on the line for making a decision with respect to either modernizing or being a security focal or being a SRE, so reliability engineer, to keep an application up. And the AI thing is telling me to do this, but I don't understand why. That's a problem. So explainability helps in that augmentation process. That's a huge deal. That's the biggest change I would say that we've seen in that progression as AI has evolved, moving towards a broader AI approach as applied to this notion of AI for IT. That's a, uh, great insights there, Nick, thank you. Uh, and here's the next question, and, and Nick, this sounds like a question for you, but I, I'd like for everybody to chime in. This is officially our last question. Uh, so Nick, uh, what's the one thing CIO should know about how this research 
is shaping future commercial offerings? Yeah, so to me, this comes back to a couple of fundamental things, right? Uh, research uh, doesn't reside in, in the lab only anymore. In fact, this uh, panel, pleasure to be here with my esteemed panelists today, is a representation of that partnerships across the academy with industrial labs and taking it a step further by co-creating with clients. No longer can we subscribe to the notion of, you know, building, they will come, right? So you build something, you continue to evolve it, and then, oh, by the way, let's push it out to the market. No, it's a very different approach, and CIOs should take a huge solace in the fact that this is exactly what we're doing, especially from an AI for IT, the intersection of hybrid cloud and AI. So as we build some initial MVP, we touched on this in each of the different examples given before, uh, the idea is to pilot. Right? And we take a look at your use cases, given your application devices, given your industry vertical. This is exactly what we're doing to ultimately get to solutions that make sense from a CIO point of view and then, of course, from a scalability point of view. No, I appreciate that. Um, and I will give uh, Dr. Singh and Dr. Ray uh, the last word if you'd like to uh, caboose off of this last question. Okay. Uh, uh, th th thanks. Uh, what I would I would think is that you know, from, at least the way I conceive of a CIO, not be, ha having been a CIO, I, I would say that their purpose is to facilitate business, right? So they're they're a CIO of a company. They, they they should be thinking about how to realize business processes, how to preserve, uh, you know, ensure security, preserve the privacy and confidentiality of their business and their stakeholders. I think what what happens a lot of the time is that they end up contending with, you know, what to my mind would be would seem to be like trivial concerns. And I think what this technology offers is that it relieves them from those trivial concerns that gives them the opportunity to to think about the business processes that they want to achieve. And then it brings up, uh, in my, to my mind, to uh, to add to some of the things that Nick said earlier. Then maybe they can worry about concerns such as accountability. They can worry about trust within the organization and across the organization. Mm -hmm. um, uh, if they, if depending on the domain, maybe they can concern, be concerned with safety and you know those kinds of bigger concerns that they should be providing to the rest of the firm. Uh, I think it offers them the opportunity to do that. Excellent, great insight. So uh, with that, I'm going to call this uh, a day. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Fuller. Dr. Singh uh, and Dr. Ray for, for spending this time. And finally, I'd like to thank uh, IBM uh, and everybody who um, up from the press community who came in and attended. So thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.